everything that media and society has told you about love is a lie. The, what we have consumed and watched since we were little uh, has, has taught us a lie about love and relationships. Let's just take a look at what I've been watching since I was a little kid, right? Disney and Hallmark movies. I'm not a big Hallmark guy, but I was big on Disney. I love Disney. I love watching mo Disney movies with my kids. But the lesson that they're teaching about love just isn't true. Take a Disney movie, for example. And I know they've kind of changed over the years. They look a little bit different now. But the ones I grew up on, they followed the similar plot. There was a young woman, and she runs into some problem. It could be anything. And in this problem, she can't overcome it by herself. And in swoops the knight in shining armor, the white knight. And in his strength, he overcomes the problem. He saves the girl and they fall madly in love. And it doesn't matter anything about them. He can be a literal beast. And yet this love will propel them to ride off into the sunset and live happily ever after. And a Hallmark movie is really no different. It starts out, the plot's a little, a little change. It starts out, there's a, a young woman and she, uh, for whatever reason, grows up in a small town and, and doesn't like the small town. So she moves on with her life. She moves to the big city and she's a huge success. And then something happens. Whether it's she loses her job, it's a vacation or a holiday, or there's a family tragedy, she is forced back into her small town. And while she's there, she reconnects with a guy who usually is like uh, that she dated or hated in high school. And I think that's why they can pump these music movies out so quickly. They're just changing one letter. But they reconnect and they hate each other. They can't stand each other because I think they see one another's flaws in each other and it just drives them apart. But then something else happens, something that will unite them, some outside force, some person or some problem that they can only overcome with each other. And they fall helplessly and madly in love and they ride off into the sunset and they live happily ever after. And that's the lie, no matter how good these movies are, that they're selling us inadvertently about love, that it always looks happily ever after, that love is going to make our relationships and our communities perfect. And the truth is, rarely does it look happily ever after. Often it looks train wreck ever after. And I say that like totally tongue in cheek because train wreck ever after is just as ridiculous as happily ever after. Community and relationships are not all good or all bad. They fall somewhere in between and are constantly shifting. There's this old, uh, this word that my, an old friend used to word, use. It was brutal. And I would say that community is brutal ever after. It is both beautiful and brutal and all the things in between. And it is inevitable because if you're in community with one another, you will inevitably have the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. You will experience deep hurt and amazing joy. There will be times of, of, of sorrow and celebration. And it leads into the second lie that, that really is about the love part. That this feeling of love will propel you forward. And love isn't a feeling. Love in community is a choice. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. We're going to be looking at authentic love in community. If you're taking notes, that's the title of the sermon. But we're looking at authentic love in community, what it looks like and how it is extended to other people. And to do this, we're going to be spending some time in 1 John. So if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and turn 1 John 4. We're going to start in verse 19. And this book, uh, to give a little context, we're just jumping right into the middle of it. It's written by the same guy uh, that is a disciple of Jesus that writes the Gospel of John. He writes this book, this letter, and he's writing to a community of Christ followers. And this community is in disarray. We don't know where it is. We don't know exactly what's happening, but we know there is conflict. There is division. They're angry at each other. And he's writing them to talk about what they need to remain uh, unified together, what it means for them as Christ followers to remain together. And he touches several topics, but one he's going to touch multiple times is love, love in community. And, 
And he writes in this really interesting style, John does. He often, he'll, he'll pick up a theme and he'll take a look at it from one angle and set it down and kind of move along in the book. And then he'll come back to the theme. And he'll look at it from a different angle. And what you'll see as we move through it, I'm going to start off in chapter four to five and then bounce back to three. And it just follows, he, he, it's almost like this spiraling narrative about, uh, about love. And that's kind of why, if you're going, why are we going backwards? That's kind of why. He's, he just writes in this circular style that we don't often see in the New Testament epistles. And John, the theme he is constantly covering again is love. In fact, he writes the word love 51 times in this little small five chapter letter. Because John was primarily concerned about love for this community. And he knew love intimately. In the Gospel of John, he writes about himself. He refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. He understands love so much that he now finds his identity not in himself, but by the love Jesus, his Savior, has extended to him. And it leads and it flows out of this letter. And he really gets to this first point that loving community depends on experiencing the love of God. That before anything else, if we're going to have love in community, it is from God. It is from our Savior. He starts out, he says, we love because he first loved us, he being Jesus, that we are able to love one another, not of our own volition, not of our own power. The love he is talking about comes solely through the love that is shown to us by Jesus Christ. It begins with him. If we're trying to have this love in community uh, based on something we get from the world, it's just not going to work. It has to come and start with Jesus. And he goes on, he says, If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God and whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. He's writing to this, this group of people that are just at each other's throats. They're hurting, they're mad at each other. And he's saying, you have to maintain love for one another. You say you're followers of Christ. You say you love God, but right now you need to be loving one another because if you're not loving one another, you're not really loving God. That they are intertwined, that they, they are one and the same, that you cannot love God and not love his poema, his masterpiece, which is the people he has redeemed. We can't hide behind this idea, oh, I love God, but there's no evidence of it. The evidence is how we love one another. And he's using some interesting words. He's talking, love your brother. He's not talking about the actual sibling. This is this world of Delphos. And what it means is brothers and sisters in Christ. He's encouraging this community that they need to love one another. That love <laughs> first shows up in the Christian community. That yes, we need to love people outside. We need to love unbelievers. We need to love people in the world. But first, we need to be able to love one another. Jesus himself said, they will know you are my disciples by the love you have for one another that the world is watching us as followers of Christ. And if they see that we can't even love one another, they see that we hate each other, that we're at each other's throats, everything we share and preach and talk about, they see as hypocrisy and a lie. That we need to live like Christ, loving one another. And really that is one of our biggest witnesses to the world is how we have love within the Christian community. And before we go on, I want to make sure that we have an understanding of what he means by love. Because I don't know about you, but in the English language, like love can mean a lot of different things. For example, I can say I love my wife, which I do, I love Jamie, and I love my kids. But when I say that, you know that the love I have for my wife and the love I have for my kids, while it overlaps, it's not the same. And it goes beyond that. The love I have for them is not the same love I have for my friends, even though I love them. The love I have for you guys, the love I have for my church, for my job, what I'm doing in my day. I can say I love all those things and they mean something different. And beyond that, right, I can get crazy. I can love uh, good barbecue. I love good barbecue. I love bacon. I love hiking. I love board games. I love contact sports. I, uh, I'm a big Seattle sports fan. I love the Seahawks and the Mariners and the Kraken, even though sometimes I'm pretty sure I hate them. But love can take so many different forms in the English language. And the same is really true 
about the language John is using. He's using ancient Greek. And in there, they understood that there were different forms of love. So in fact, they had four different words for love. And the first one would be the storge. And the best way to describe it would be familial affection. It's that natural love that you have for someone who is a part of your family. It's the way a brother loves his sister, even though they may not like each other at all sometimes. You know, that no one can make fun of you except for me, that kind of love. It's the love a parent has for the child, that unconditional love, despite whatever choices they make, despite how much they hurt them, they have that love because of their innate connection. And it can go beyond family. It can be with some people who you are almost family, the friends that become family. But it is best described as a love that naturally exists between family members. And it's a good love, but it's actually a love that is never specifically, this word is never specifically used in the Bible. There's, it's good, it's talked about, but it's not the love John was concerned about. There's another love, eros. This is that romantic love. It's that passion, that spark, that, that desire you feel for someone else. In its wrong use, it can come across as lust. And it is a good love. It's a love that God created with a proper context between a man and a woman, particularly in the confines of marriage. And this is, as you probably guessed, not the love John is talking about. And in fact, this word doesn't actually show up in the Bible. It's talked about quite a lot. There's an entire book, the Song of Solomon, that really goes into Eros. But he's not saying you guys need Eros for one another. And there's another one, Philia. This is that friendship love that kind of like love mishmash that you have with a group or another person. And it usually is formed over some bond about a third party, maybe a, a hobby or a church or a group or a mission, whatever it may be, that love kind of exists because of that thing pulling you together. And again, it's a good love. It's written about in the Bible. This word is actually used and, and it's good. And I think it leads to the next love. It's actually when people are looking for a life group, they're, they're really a lot of times looking for this, this philia. They're trying to get a connection with someone else that they can just enjoy. And it's really good, but it's not, again, the love John is talking about. It, will, it often leads to this one. The one he's talking about is agape love. And unlike the other three loves, it's not about a feeling you have for somebody. It's a choice. It is a willful choice to love somebody. The word literally means charity. It is a charitable love. In fact, if you pick up the King James Version of the Bible and you read through it, it doesn't say love in there. It says charity. It's a form of love that is about uh, sacrificing yourself for someone else. It is selfless. It is self-serving. It's about making a choice to give of yourself for someone else without anything expected in return. And the truth is it's not of this world that we don't have it except when we receive it from God because it's not transactional, it is one way. And that's what John was saying, this love, this agape comes solely from God. He goes on to say, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commands. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. John starts writing kind of in this circular argument. He's like, you love God by the love you have for other people, but you love other people because of the love you have for God. And to kind of clarify it, what it is, is we receive love through Christ, through the sacrifice he has made, and because of that, we feel love, and we can love God back, but that love pours out in evidence through how we love other people. It starts with God and then it extends out to other people. And, and John is saying, really, we know how to love other people. We know how to have agape based on the commandments of God. They're not just rules to follow the checklist. They are ways that God wants us to love other people. And if we want to extend this agape love, we can follow his commands. And to be clear, this isn't like, hey, now you're to follow these out of obligation. Because if you're going to go and try to love people out of obligation, it doesn't work. You probably run into someone who's trying, like forcing their way to love. And it is so weird. They may go and meet someone's need and help them out. But there's no love behind it. It's just so that they will look good. And it doesn't build community and relationship. It often destroys it. 
because love doesn't come through human willpower. It comes from God. And so when we're, command, we're following his commands, it's not about us forcing ourselves to do it. What it is, is allowing the Holy Spirit to work within us. That we receive the love of God and we feel it through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within us. And we cannot help but have it overflow out of us. That in our relationships with other people, we have agape because we have agape from him. And so the next part is we have love in community, or excuse me, love in community is extending the love of God to one another. That we have received this love from God and now we are extending it to each other. And so we're going to go back a little bit. John 3, we're backtracking now another point where he's looking at love. He's talking about the same kind of love, agape. Every time it appears, it's agape. And he's kind of talking about it in a different way. How does this actually look? Yes, we receive it from God, but what does it look like as we go out into the world? And he says, by this, we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. He's really just repeating what Jesus said during his ministry. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. That agape love looks like uh, the love of Jesus. And we have in the gospel, the perfect example of loving community. It is Jesus Christ giving up heaven, coming down to earth, literally laying down his life, dying on a cross and suffering so that we could be presented as justified in front of God so that we could be restored with him. That is loving community. That is agape love. And he did it without the expectation of anything in return. And John says, really, how we take that love is we do the exact same thing. We ought to lay down our lives for the brothers and sisters in Christ. That out of the laying down of life for Jesus, we turn around and do the same thing. And this word ought there, I, this is one of those times where that translation gets tricky because ought to me means like, oh, well, if it's really convenient and it works out and, it, it, and you have the time to, you should probably do this. It better reads, you are to lay down your lives for the brothers. That because of what Jesus has done for you, you are to do the same. He goes on, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. That John says this love is to take on a tangible quality. Agape isn't just something we say we have for one another. It's something that we do for one another. Uh, last week, G, or excuse me, Pastor Jeremy, he talked about uh, this idea of people saying they're going to pray for one another. And interestingly enough, uh, in our teaching team meeting, one of them, several weeks ago, we're prepping our sermons. We prepped completely apart from each other. We come together and we both have the same idea and the same thing that we're witnessing. That people, Christians, that we hide behind this. I'll pray for you. We see our, our, our brothers and sisters in Christ in need and we, we say, oh, I'll pray for you. And then we go home and we don't even pray for each other. That we hide behind prayer instead of actually laying down our lives for one another. And I, 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 I wrestle with using the word hide because I don't think this is something evil or out of laziness or out of a desire not to care for each other. I believe that we don't lay down our lives for one another. We say, oh, I'll pray for you and then don't do it because we're too busy. We in the American church as, as Christians in America, we have such busy lives that we don't really have much life to lay down for one another. I want to, I'm going to walk through, through a normal schedule of my day. I get up, I get up about 5, 5.30 in the morning. I work out, I read my Bible, I pray. And then I spend a little bit of time just reading stuff on the internet or playing a game, just some amount of time before my day starts off just to clear my mind, just to have a little peace and quiet. And then my day really takes off. 
my kids wake up. Right now I have three. We do foster care. That's why I say right now. I have three kids and a wife. So we all wake up right around seven o'clock and, and just we have a ton of stuff to do, right? I have a, one daughter who's seven. She's in second grade. I have to get her ready for school. Uh, we have a four-year-old son who has a short amount of school every day who has to, has to get ready. And we have a one-year-old who has to get ready for the day and has to be taken care of every minute of the day, right? So we set off, and in this, what we want to do is we want to provide a healthy, filling meal for them to get them through the day, to start out their day right. So we cook almost every single meal, every breakfast, every morning, and then we sit down together because we think it's important that we start every day off in positive relation. We sit down around the dinner table, and we eat together. And while all this is going on, of course, my daughter, she's getting ready for school. We, we don't do everything for her, but we guide her through getting ready, making a lunch for herself, getting all prepped for the day. I have two dogs, so while I'm doing all this, I'm feeding the dogs and taking them out. Jamie and I are connecting about what our days look like, how can we support each other. And then 8.35 rolls around, and we're out the house. I'm out the house. Usually, I take Raya and drop her off at school, and then we're all at work. We work through the whole day. But during the day, there's a lot to be done on top of work. We have to work. But again, my son, he goes to speech therapy. Uh, so we take him three times a week during the middle of the day. He has to be taken to speech therapy. He has to be dropped off and picked up. We have a foster daughter who has visits from time to time. So we have to make sure she's ready and set to go and make sure we're all in communication with DHS on top of the visits to the doctor and the nurses. Our day is meetings and, and, and projects and taking care of kids. And then the school day ends and everybody has to be picked up and taken back home. But Jamie and I, our work day isn't done, so we still have work. And then the evening comes and we want to provide, again, our kids a good meal. So we cook most every meal at home. And again, we sit down for almost every single me dinner so that we can be together. And the evening is full of chores and we have kids who we want to spend time with because raising kids isn't about just quality time, it's also quantity of time. So we want to make sure we spend as much as we can time together with each of them every night. And I want to read to them because I want them to be able to read and understand knowledge is important. And I want my daughter to be successful in reading because she's right at that stage. And also we still have animals to take care of. We have chores because laundry and dishes, they don't do themselves as much as I wish they could. And it's just Thing after thing, from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to bed, our day is just filled with taking care of work and each other and, and whatever, whatever else. I haven't even touched on when there's sports, when there's life group, when there's like those emergency projects, say a water line down your road bursts. All these things come up and our day is just filled to the brim with stuff. And I look at that schedule and I look at the busyness of our lives and I'm like, how can I ever hope to lay my life down? I don't, I don't even have a life for myself. There's nothing left. We are so busy, so filled to the brim of things to do that we don't have any way to lay down to extend agape love. And what makes me really sad is that I look at that schedule and for a lot of people, a lot of people in our church, that doesn't even begin to touch the busyness of your lives. That if I had to take a guess, particularly for people with kids, our busy schedule is like bottom 25% of busyness. That you and I and everyone here, we are so overly filled to the max. We have no margin in our lives to have love, let alone have community. Several years ago, this is about seven to 10 years. I'm not really good with timelines. Jamie and I, we were feeling this busyness. We were feeling a lack of community. We were feeling an inability to live out this general calling that God has given us for, for each of us to live out in our lives. And we started evaluating our life. We actually had sat down and had multiple difficult conversations, not because of conflict, but because we recognized that things were going to have to change. And we started looking at our lives and saying, how can we do any of this with what we have? See, at the time, we had just, we had this business that Jamie, out of it, had been offered a job with the state, which paid great money, and I was making great money, and things were going well, but it meant that she had to travel a lot. And while this is all going on, we're trying to have a daughter, and then, of course, she's born. And anytime you have a newborn, you don't have any time. And on top of that, we're coaching lacrosse at the high school during certain seasons. We would get up in the morning to go to work, and we would finish work and basically go to bed all day, every day. There was no room for community. There was no room for love. There was no room for laying down our lives. 
and we knew something had to change. And so we st- sat down and started creating a plan of how do our lives allow us to live more Christ-like? And we had to sacrifice money. We had to sacrifice things we enjoyed. We love coaching lacrosse. But these things weren't leading us to where we really wanted to be. And I, I struggled whether or not to share the story because I don't want it to be like, oh, Drew, pat myself on the back in front of everybody. Great job. I want to encourage you that if you're feeling that busyness that you can't lay your life down for other people, it can change. You can make steps over time to have a life that God desires for you. It is going to take sacrifice. It is going to take giving things up. But I have to say that I would not go back and change it for anything. The life we have now, the less busyness that we have now is totally worth it. And it can be totally worth it for you too. It can allow you to have the love God desires for you in community. And I feel like this, this whole sermon has just been a negative. Like you guys, you guys, I say that, me too. Like we don't have any agape. What are we doing? We're failing in community. And, and it's way more nuanced than that. That's not the truth. The truth is we are doing this. I can say with, with pride that our church is loving people how we're supposed to. We take care of our community. I wanted to share some quick stories that just happened over the past several months. That we, uh, uh, a sermon a little while ago, I talked about how my truck, I was towing a trailer and we're going up the hill and it died. And we're like panicking. What are we going to do? How is this going to work out? We're going to be stuck here or stuck with a thousand dollar towing bill. And after the sermon, a family came up to my wife and said, hey, we want you to know if that ever happens again, you don't have to worry. We're there. We will drop whatever we're doing and come take care of you. You don't need to stress. Your people will be there for you. That is agape love. That is laying down your life. Right now we're going through this issue with DHS. We have our adopted son, Dean. And he just had a full biological sibling born over in Coos County. And there's this whole big deal about, I I don't want to get into the, but basically they won't send her to be with us, which is what is supposed to happen from my understanding to the law, because uh, some other thing, I don't know. But what it comes to this is this. After my wife is sharing this with somebody at our church, they say, hey, you know what? If it makes it possible, I will drive her across the county day after day to go to visit so that she can be with you. She was willing to sacrifice her time and her resources so that we, so that Dean could be with his sister. That is agape love. That is laying down your life. I joked about the the water pipe bursting. That has been my reality for the past two and a half months. I have now patched five holes in my water line on top of adding in a backflow regulator and moving the pressure relief valve and and the on-off valve because we were opening it with uh, needle or excuse me channel lock pliers. And as I'm sharing this with a buddy, a family friend, he says, "What are you doing? I'm a plumber. I'm going to come down. I'm going to give up my day off. I'll come down and I'll help you do all of this work." And he does. He gives up time, his own free time to come and love us. That is agape love. That is laying down your life. That is happening. But what I want to ask is, what would it look like if we had enough margin in our schedule that these stories were happening more frequently? What would it look like if this agape love that's laying down our life didn't just happen in the big emergencies, but in the little things throughout the day? What if we could love each other like that at all times? What would our church look like? What would Douglas County look like if they witnessed us doing that moment after moment, day after day? We have to be a people who are less busy to be a people who can love more. And there's another aspect of laying down your life. Sometimes it doesn't look like laying down uh, a resource, giving of your time or money. For some of us, well, really for all of us at different moments of our lives, laying down our lives is going to be laying down our egos, our pride, or our, our preferences, our desires in relationship. That a lot of times laying down your life is dealing with the difficulties in community and relationship that you cannot be in community without inevitably having uh, uh, conflict, without running into people who are just like you, who are flawed and broken and make mistakes and hurt one another. 
And we have to be a people who lays down their lives by, by working towards both forgiveness and reconciliation. Being around people and extending love to people who sometimes or maybe often we don't really even like. And, and there's two ways that I see that I think are really simple ways that we can do this. This isn't an exhaustive, but these are two things that I see we can do. The first one, Jeremy talked about last week. He talked about that accountability piece, which is kind of a weird vision of accountability, but I think it fits really well. That Jesus goes to his disciples and says, hey, hey, you hurt me. I needed you and you weren't there for me. He goes to them and lays out his heart and says, you've wronged me, but I love you. And he fights for a relationship and says, I want to be with you guys still, but we need to fix some things. And this is the side that I often struggle with because when conflict, big enough conflicts come in relationship, my nature is just to say, you know what? I'm going to write that person off. I'm going to move on. I'm done with them. If you write everybody off, you can't have community. Sometimes laying down your life is being honest and having the difficult conversations. And there's the other side of this. For some of us, for sometimes what we need to do is we need to really just be like a Disney princess. We need to just let it go. Just let it go. That we need to extend the grace that has been given to us and extend it to others by sometimes not making every little problem World War III. That some things just, they don't need to be approached. You can just take a deep breath and let it go because it's not that big of a deal. Not every mistake was meant to offend you. That when you send your, your spouse to the store to get 25 items at three different things, three different places, and they come back with 24 of them, they didn't forget the one to offend you. They just made a mistake. Give them some grace. Or you're having that conversation with a friend and they mention a story about something they're dealing with and it reminds you of something that you did 10 years ago. And now you're like, well, they're just being passive aggressive, trying to get at me. And guess what? It wasn't even about you. You can just let it go. Sometimes laying down your life just means letting the small things go and having some grace for one another and understanding we're not perfect. Give each other a break. Loving community is about receiving the love that God has, that Jesus showed us by laying down his life for us on the cross. And loving community is then taking that love and extending it to the people around us. Thank you guys for joining us today. I love you. Have a great day. Thank you so much for sticking around. Today's transformational moment, I have a couple questions I'd like you to wrestle with. The first one is this, am I receiving God's love? That if we're to have love and community, it starts with a relationship with Jesus. If you haven't received the love of Christ, if you haven't given your life to him and become a follower of Christ, everything I talked about today, everything else that I spoke about isn't going to mean anything because it starts with a relationship with him so that you can receive fully his love. And the second question I have is, how can I create margin to extend agape? Take a good look at your life. Is it really too busy to love and lay your life down for one another? And if it is, where, what can you change? What can you eliminate so that that is possible in your life? We also have a missional moment. We've been talking about the blessed strategy that we begin with prayer, that we ask God to join, or excuse me, to reveal where he is working so that we can join him. Then, then we move on to listen, that we find people that God is working in their lives and we just listen to where they are. That we take time to invite them to come eat with us or even go over, be willing to go over to somebody else's house so that we can create a deeper connection and serve one another, that laying down our life, that we would give of our time or our resources to take care of somebody in need. And the last part, is share, share your story about how Jesus has transformed your life. Thank you guys. Have a great day.